Hello and welcome to episode three of the 42 Six Nations show. We are excited to be joined by Eddie O'Sullivan, the former Ireland coach this week. And we're going to be delving into England's new head coach, Eddie Jones. We'll look a bit at his media dealings, we'll look at his attack, and we'll also look at the defensive changes that Paul Gustard has brought into the setup. Eddie, thanks a million for joining us. What are your experience of Eddie Jones as a coach? You've coached against him, you've actually won against him. What have you, what have you found with Eddie? Well, when he coached Australia, which is a while back, we're talking about maybe 10 years or more, he was very patterned in his play. And um, Australia were a team that played to very straight shapes. They combined physicality with kind of a lot of skill. And I think he was very successful that he got them to the World Cup final in 2003. Um, all but for a drop goal from Johnny Wilkinson, they might have won that World Cup. But I've always found him very technical, very tactical, and a uh, very clear vision of what he wants. And um, in terms of a coach, when you're coaching against him, you really had to do your homework uh, because he was able to pick teams apart. I would say, for me, he was one of the most difficult coaches to work against because of his ability in the technical and tactical areas. Yeah, absolutely. Like one of the interesting things for, for a journalist, anyway, is he's come in with this massive kind of media persona. We knew it was coming, but it's been very entertaining. I was over at the Six Nations launch and. Like he had the room in stitches with laughter. He was telling stories about Stoke City and comparing rugby teams to them. All these kind of, I guess they're distractions. What, like, what, what's a coach's thinking in that kind of sphere? He's talked about Ireland's kicking game a lot. He's gone from 60% to 70% now in, in today's newspapers. What, what's he trying to achieve there? I think he's just playing silly burgers with the media. Just to track away from the real meat of what the media might ask him. About his tactics, about what his intentions are in selection. So he, he, he plays it really well, and he's very comfortable in his own skin. He's very happy in that environment, and he sees it as a bit of a cat and mouse game with the media. I mean, when you refer to mind games, you're talking about the opposition. But the truth of the matter is he's playing the mind games with the media because the media love the headlines, they love the one-liners. The fact that he said that Ireland play Australian rules, we analyse it, we find that England actually kicked the ball more. He knew that when he said it. But he knew the media would run off on it and make a big storm about it. But no, you can't imagine Joe Schmidt at night, you know, worrying about what Eddie is saying about Ireland. That's the last thing on his mind. But it's great lines for the media, and the media are right into it because they think he's trying to go with Ireland. But he's kind of laughing away behind it. But the bottom line is, a lot of these interviews and a lot of these uh, media events. You get very little information out of Eddie as to exactly what his plans are, what he's going to do. So he gives nothing away and he keeps everyone entertained. Yeah, it is, it is certainly, I guess, a distraction from what England are actually doing in attack. He talks about Ireland's kicking tactics. As you said, England have actually kicked more. I think they're 36% possession kicked away, whereas Ireland are just under 24% so far. So he, he does distract a little bit. He talks about Ireland playing a style of rugby that he wouldn't want to play, but there are actually strong similarities there. Looking back at those England... Uh, games against Scotland and Italy, certainly. There's a lot of one-out play. There's a lot of really simple, direct rugby. And there certainly are echoes of Ireland in what England are trying to do. Would you agree with that? Well, I, I think what he's doing at the moment with England is he's... he's you, evol, it's evol, evolving rather than revolving, you know. It's an evolution rather than a revolution. But I think if you look at him tactically, he hasn't changed a lot. He's still going to the air with a pressure. Uh, he's still doing one-off carries at the contact because they're his strength areas. But I think what he's trying to do slowly and surely is to increase the pace of England's game. Yeah. Because England, for years, have played that similar physical style, but it's been lumbering and slow. And a lot of teams eventually shut them down on that. Whereas what he's trying to do is stay with what they're good at, but do it a lot quicker and a lot better. And if he can create quicker ball with those big forward runners, they do have strike corners uh, in the back line to hurt you. But I think he knows himself that if they don't change the pace at which they play, then they will be one potential like they have been for a number of years. And I think part of that as well is getting them fitter. And if you remember, he harkened back to that a couple of weeks ago about the team being fitter and challenging guys to be fitter. And the interesting thing about that, it's all overarched by the way he communicates for the team publicly. Mm. He's inclined to challenge the England team to get fitter, to put you know, a bucket of points on it. 
he's almost throwing it out there in public for them. A lot of things you might say in private, you say in publicly. It's an interesting start from in terms of his management style, challenging the team publicly all the time to perform. Um, and it's something he can't do for four years. Yeah. But he's starting out along that line to try and generate some energy in the players. Yeah. And we, I don't think they've been really tested yet. Their first two games are probably the, the easiest games. But he'll take that because he was able to build on the success of those. Yeah. Like the tempo, the tempo point is really interesting because we've seen England, I think they threw three quick line outs in Scotland. There's quick tap penalties, something we probably wouldn't have seen under Lancaster. And as well as that, like it's, for a new head coach coming in, I imagine you have to be as simple as possible. You have to simplify everything for players. And he's, he's gone for the tempo in a very basic shape, would you say? Because before England played with a lot of those diamonds where they'd have a forward at the front of the diamond and there was a passing option at the back for, for one of the playmakers. But they haven't done as much of that, that. There's just been a little bit more simplicity. So if they are playing off 10, it's just a direct runner. Now, there is options off that. And we saw that probably for the, the Newell try against Scotland and also for, for that offload try that Jamie George gave to Owen Farrell against Italy. So there's options to play out there. Do you think we'll see it uh, maybe step forward another level against Ireland? Yeah, I think he'll try and gradually, as I said, incrementally build forward what he's doing and add more and more and more as he goes. You're right. He couldn't completely change everything. Um, so he got his stall set out generally. Now, remember, he hasn't gone away from his strength, which is the physicality England can bring. That's going to remain. And I think that it'll be absolutely brutally physical on the weekend in Ireland. But he's trying to bring that brutality with pace. I mean, he's he said, again, I thought, interesting, it's going to take two or three years from the peak. It's a smart thing for a coach to do, to say, like, you know, you got to give me two or three years here before I give him we're going. It's a good strategy. But, but again, I think that gives away in his head. He thinks this is going to be a gradual, slow change. But he believes, I think, in his heart of hearts, if he can combine that physicality that England can bring with pace and speed and tempo, they can play with anybody, including the All Blacks. Yeah, it's, it's a fair assertion. It's a fair idea. I think there's a little bit of echoes of, of what he did with Japan, but they didn't have the athletes. In terms of he brought that tempo, he brought that one out rugby. I think in the World Cup, Japan had 66% of their phases with just one pass. So they, they built that tempo and they stretched the defence before they strike wide. I think the, that winning try against South Africa was a really good example. But then there was also this other side to the game where they struck really well off set piece. Now, Eddie Jones has been on the record saying the Japanese players are brilliant for this because they'll follow his instructions to a T. But I think it's something that we might see yeah. built, in, sure. built in with England as well because he, he has that brain for, for set piece strikes. And when you have that physicality, it's insane not to use a, a really strong ball carrier on a first phase strike when everyone's in a good position. Do you, do you think that's a, uh, something to evolve there for Eddie Jones? Yeah, that's part of the evolution. I mean, to be fair to Eddie, again, as like a good, any good coach, he will build his house based on the resource available. You know, in Australia, he had a team that could play a very pattern game. They had, um, George, they had uh, George Greig and, and Steve Larkin and halfbacks who were like no conductors. And he used them brilliantly to build their tempo into their game. Um, he knew with Japan and anyone that's you know, seen Japan play, they were a team that are incredibly accurate technically and they play exactly to what you tell them, but they do it very well. But they have to play a quick game. You know, you saw with the scrum, literally the ball was in the scrum for four nanoseconds before it was gone because they knew they couldn't really compete with the big teams. So that's adapting to his environment, which is smart. But with England, he knows he has horses that can go to war, you know, with the big teams. So he's not going to abandon that physicality. That's, he's going to bring that physicality into his game. You've seen it already. and But you can see the, the, the really crucial second dimension to that is if he can bring speed and tempo with that. And then he'll layer into that the technical players, like the starter players, the rolling players. And if that would be a very potent combination with the ball because you've got pace, you've got power, you've got speed. And you've got technicality. Yeah, I want to ask you about the, the kind of set piece again because you obviously have a very strong reputation in that department with Ireland and, and you use guys like Brian Driscoll really well on, on kind of pre-planned moves. And, and now Joe Schmidt has obviously become famed in that kind of sense as well, his power plays where he goes three, four phases of really mapped out uh, play and everyone knows their role specifically. As a coach, like when you're building those plays, is it 
is it based on your own strengths or is it based on what you see in the opposition or, or is it a, a mix and match of all those things? It's always based on two things. It's based on uh, the weakness of the opposition and then the, the players you have to exploit that. So when you craft a game plan, and this is getting, the game is getting more and more strategic as we go forward. There's more analysis done, uh, there's more planning. Um, but you look at the opposition, you say, is this defence, for example, a blitz defence, an open-in defence? How do we break a blitz defence down? And the way to break down a blitz defence is you can't make more than one pass before you go to the line, but you spread out the defence and you go through them. Um, I remember that probably worked at its best for us back in 2006 against South Africa. Um, they came to Lansdowne Road and we played them in the summer and we knew they blitzed. And we spread them out that day in Lansdowne Road and we went through them a lot of the time. Whereas the other sample example is against England. Um, England, when I was coach, had a very tight defence and they played a very soft drift defence. And um, we played a different shape against them. We played three channel attack. With, we kept runners wide in the outside channels and we didn't spend much time in the middle of the field but they were strong. And if you remember um, back in 2004 or 2006 when we beat them at Twickenham, we beat them by getting around the corners and then going through the middle when they spread out and keeping that balance in our game. But it, it took a bit of time to develop those strategies. But once the players got in their heads, that was the goal. That's what they were trying to do. It, they grew into it. But that was my philosophy, looking at the, the opposition and then building, crashing the game to exploit the weakness. But at this level, you have a lot of top caliber players available. And you can... Or have you have that luxury of changing your game plan very frequently? When you're building those set plays and when they're working really well for your team, do, does it ever get to the point where the team's confidence is completely dependent on those things? Or if they don't get a good gain line on first phase from a move that's always worked for them, that it can dent confidence a little bit? Do you think that's happening with Ireland at times? Well, I think you have to remember that you can't win every collision or you can't win every gain line. But if you look at any attacking set over what 10, 15 phases. If you win a greater percentage, if you win 70% of your collisions over you know, 10 or 15 phases, you are making progress, you're going forward. The problem is when your percentage of wins drops down to about 30%, and you found that after 10 or 15 phases, you're probably back where you started. And at the moment with Ireland's phase attack, well, if we go back to the World Cup before, it found against very physical teams like England, that they could meet us straight on in the game line and they were able to shut us down pretty well. We found it hard to break them down. I thought in the game against Wales, I thought I saw green shoots where we were trying to move the strike point a little bit. We never changed our overall shape, but we were actually making an effort to move the ball one or two passes away before the contact, which was working pretty well for us. Um, I think though, when we went to Paris, the weather had a big impact on that. We couldn't really... We couldn't do that anymore in those conditions. And I think France defended much better than we saw them against uh, Italy. They got off their line. They made a lot of big hits in the rain, which is easier to do. So you'd like to think next Saturday we'll go back to... If the weather's good enough, we'll go back to moving the strike point against England because we, I think we have to accept that if we try to bully England next weekend in Twickenham, it's going to be a long day to break them down. And probably on a balance, they win that battle physically. So... We have to be creative in how we go about breaking them down. Um, I think, the, like, the last time we were in Twickenham, off the after plays, we were excellent. We got round the corners, we got into the outside channels, we got good lines. It's when we get into our phase game, that England seemed to be able to, 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 to shut us down. And we found it very hard to break them down. And I think it cost us that game. Yeah, like, Ireland have struggled against that, that blitz defence at times. They've... They've looked short of ideas or of variation, maybe, and, and that's something you're, you're referring to there. H have you seen big changes in England's defence? Paul Guster has come in, obviously famed for his kind of wolf pack mentality at Saracens. Um, has he notably shifted the system? They, they seem to be a little less cohesive going forward, but even more aggressive, perhaps. Yeah, I think he's brought two things to them in defence. And this seems to be his trademark. Which every coach in their mindset has their own philosophy on defending. I mean, the, even within the systems they use, their philosophy will permeate. Um, he's he wants an extremely aggressive line. 
because he feels that they get off the line and make hits. Again, their physicality, they can really disrupt teams. And I think you saw it with Italy last week or two weeks ago when late in the game, Italy were trying to chase the game. They were tired. I think they were getting off their line at 100 miles an hour and smashing the Italians. So that's one area you'll see is they get off the line. And the other area is they're being incredibly disruptive at the rocks. If you're going to put a second guy into a rock to defend, he has to have an impact on the rock. Obviously not give away a penalty. That's not a good impact. <laughs> but if you're in there, what you have to do is slow down the ball if you can. If you can't slow down the ball, get out of there. Now, at this level, a lot of teams are very good at preventing you getting to the ball because they seal it off legally by getting into the space and jumping the ball. But you watch the English guy, the second guy in fights like he's in a barroom brawl. He's And then he kicks the ball out the back of the rock if he can. The amount of ball England have kicked out of rocks in the last couple of weeks. It's an interesting... Like a lot of teams, the guy goes in and he pushes and shoves, but he doesn't do much. England are disruptive. They're kicking the ball out the back of the rock. Their shape is a little suspect based on their line speed at times. Uh, because they push very hard in the middle. If you can sit that down or hold it, there has to be space wide. Easier said than done. But I think at times you've seen England who have been slightly exposed wide. But teams that haven't had the where but to expose it. But I think it's going to be very hard to go through this England. You have to find ways to go around them. Yeah. Like when you're, when you're getting that, say, B defender, maybe three men out from the rook, leading the line speed up, um, and he's slightly ahead of his teammates, is there a chance for those little tip-on passes? We haven't seen too much of it from Ireland. I think there was one against France where Tommy O'Donnell and CJ Sander linked up and they made a lovely bust because yeah. that, that line speed defender really got isolated. And it may not be a massive line break, but it's, it's a really good gain line and you can play off that. Do Ireland need to look at those little tiny tweaks? It's just a tiny little tip-on pass and maybe they can open up defence that way. Well, the, t- the, the, the thing, the trade-off with a fast line speed is if the line speed gets up and makes contact, it wins the game. Line. But if you can move the ball away from that space before they arrive, they're vulnerable outside. Now, sometimes it's actually not that complicated. Sometimes it's actually taking that contact um, and not necessarily winning the game, line, but moving the ball instantaneously away before the defense can adjust. So sometimes you might accept the contact, but the ball will leave very quickly. Because if you try and fight through that contact and they've got off their line really well, you might win another yard or yard and a half. But the ball is going to be much slower. If you notice with attacks and defences, I, I watch an attack, an attack based on who's in control. When the, when the attack are winning collision after collision after collision, or most of them, they're in control of the tempo. But once the defence win a couple of collisions, then the defence take control. And that's when you see a lot of teams kicking the ball away because they know they don't have any option to go forward. And the thing about defence is that one big hit can kill all their momentum and they take control of the set. Whereas if you can keep those collisions going one after another or getting into space and getting behind them, create a quick rock, then the defence start to scramble and the, the attack have the advantage. Yeah, that, that, I think that leads completely in again to the need for Ireland to have that variety and maybe slight bit more width in their phase play, even in the 22, because if they're just playing short phases, one-out stuff, and England get that second man over the ball, well then we're going to see the same picture again where Ireland just aren't moving forward. In fact, moving backward as the phases go on, I think it's really important that they bring back those shapes. Maybe we saw a bit of last season before the World Cup where they use it forward to pass. They're, they're missing Peter Manning in that regard, I think, but guys like CJ Standard, guys like Jamie Heesib, they can, they can move that ball, even just that one little pass uh, extra on and, and really uh, pose a different question. And I think we saw, that. we saw that starting against Wales. I think we saw a little more of that happening. And I would suspect that's on the menu again this week. But I still think we're going to have to get into the outside channels at some point and run hard at them. Eddie Jones has sort of opened up that debate about the Aussie rules and the kicking game and it's something that follows Ireland everywhere but England actually have built a, a really strong kicking game under him. Two of their tries actually have come directly from Gary Owens. The, the Jack Nowell try against Scotland came from that source and uh, also the first try for George Ford actually came from one of his kicks, a Gary Owen that they turned over in the Italian 22. 
is, is that a, an area that they'll actually look at Ireland and go, hang on a second, Ireland aren't as strong as they were in the air. They used to be the kind of force here, but I, I feel like sides are actually challenging Ireland there and maybe taking away a, a source of confidence for Ireland. Do you think that's coming this weekend? Well, the thing about the, the, the contestable or the bomb is that if it's, the bomb is good enough, if the quality of the kick is good enough, it doesn't matter who's catching it. They're going to get tackled when they come down and get put under pressure. And if you have momentum running onto those rocks, you can actually turn them over. But, but I wouldn't look at Ireland as a, a team that are weak in that area. I mean, Rob Kearney is one of the best guys in the air. Um, and I think even whoever's on the wings, probably the one guy that might put a bit of pressure on is Andrew Trimble. But having said that, he hasn't shown much weakness in that area. He's been very good in the high ball. So it wouldn't be an area that I would go after Ireland and say, well, that's how we're going to beat Ireland. I don't think that's really a weakness in our game. Um, but I do think they'll use it because a good enough kick, it doesn't matter who's under it. You know, when it comes down, you're going to get hammered and that can happen. And even if you recover it, you're going to have to kick it out and to give them a good beachhead position to start their next attack. So... I think you'll see them kicking, but not because they think we're bad, but because they think they're good enough to bring the pressure, get, get them to give us the, get them the ball back. Yeah, it, it seems to be a bit of a default when they when they're attacking in the middle of the pitch, maybe two or three phases, and they and they're not really going anywhere. And George Ford just drops back and he puts one up, and they chase it really well. I think that's kind of their default in that area of the pitch. Like Ireland have targeted England's wings maybe a bit in the last couple of seasons with crossfield kicks, balls in behind. Anthony Watson and Jack Nell, do you think they're susceptible in that area? They are a bit, yeah. They are a bit susceptible in that area. But I think in recent years, England defended very narrow and they left those wings very isolated. And it was easy to pick them out. I don't know if Gus would be that naive to let them isolate it in those outside spaces. It's what happened with England is they left those guys isolated. When they won the ball, it was great, but when they didn't, they were, they were in big trouble. I, I would suspect they would try and send more guys to that area or be aware of that kick and get supported. Because the best way to, to defend those kicks is have a jumper who goes after the ball and tries to win it, and a guy who's coming in late to support him if he wins it, or if the ball breaks, or the other guy gets it, he can make the tackle and try and win the breaking ball. It, that, that's doable if you're aware of it. You have to be very aware of when you can go, because that secondary guy is to come from the midfield, and he can't go early until he knows the kick is going in. Yeah. Um, well, it's very doable if you're aware of it. Yeah, like tying all these elements together, Eddie, and and despite the negativity around Ireland, like it's going to be a close fixture again, possibly even a one-score game again, as it has been with Joe Schmidt in England uh, in recent years. Like, where do your confidence levels lie for for this fixture? Do you think England have that bounce effect from Eddie Jones, or or do Ireland have a good idea what's coming against them? And if they if they play a smart game plan, this is a very winnable fixture. Well, I think that. It's a very accurate way of putting it. But I think the whole dynamic would be based on England. Are, no matter what Eddie Jones says, everybody knows England are favourites for this game. And if Ireland were to win a tweak in them on Saturday, it would be a big upset. And it could derail England's Six Nations. Because the next team up for England is Wales in Twickenham. And if Wales were to get them in Twickenham, it would be a catastrophe because it would also hark straight back to the World Cup pool match. And all that will kick off again. So these are huge games for Eddie Jones and England. So if Ireland were to turn England over here, it would be a massive result. Ireland's best chance of making it happen, though, is defensively we've got to be really smart and keep the width that we did against Wales in the second half and also be able to bring physicality with that to contain England. Now, we do that on the defensive side of the ball. We're in the game. With the attack... If we are box clever and we don't try and bully England physically, then and we look for the spaces, I think we can we can really challenge them. That would be based on us surviving at the set piece. The line out will be fine, but the scrum will come under the under the pump for sure. And then the overarching psychology of the game is remember because England are favourites, every minute that ticks off the clock and they haven't put Ireland underway, the pressure builds on England. Yeah. So the message for Ireland will be stay in the game. Stay in the game. Stay in the game. Then every minute comes off the clock, the pressure builds on England. If there's pressure on at minute one, imagine the pressure at minute 79 if they haven't put it away. Yeah. And that would be my mantra going into that game. But it's predicated on ticking those boxes with set-piece, attack, and defence. 
and a course discipline. And I, but the worry is for me is that maybe if the scrum unhinges, we could be in big trouble. But we know that's common. It's a, it's a big question mark. I think you've put the game plan together nicely there, Eddie. Um, thanks a million for your insight. Really appreciate it. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us again. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube. And we'll be back next week, hopefully reflecting on a win in Twickenham.